Okay. <laughs> so, uh, okay, are you ready? Yeah. Ready to go? Uh, so, uh, uh, we're going to uh, continue to look at uh, uh, various kinds of perceptions, uh, yeah, how to develop perceptions uh, on the Buddhist path. Uh, and um, the uh, things that we looked at yesterday was uh, basically how to overcome uh, ill will and how to overcome harmfulness. Uh, yeah, so these are essentially about perceiving things in such a way that you can give rise to metta and compassion. That's what it is, what we did yesterday, what we looked at yesterday. And this is kind of interesting because um, sometimes we maybe not consider the idea of metta in this way, but, uh, but the idea is always that if you see things in a certain way, then you will tend to have metta. If you see things in a certain way, you tend to have karuna. So we can actually develop these qualities by simply how we perceive people in daily life. Yeah, This is kind of the idea behind that. Uh, and uh, in the suttas, they actually talk about this. They talk about the uh, avyapada sanya and the ahingsaka sanya. These are perceptions. Avyapada is like non-ill will. Ahingsaka is non-harming. And so perceptions that relate to non-harming and to non-ill will. And these are essentially the same as the perceptions of metta and the perceptions of karuna because non-ill will is metta and non-harming is basically karuna or compassion. Uh, there is a third one of these. Uh, these things always go together, if you know, know the uh, second factor of the Noble Eightfold Path. Uh, and the third one is the Nekama uh, Sanya, the perception of uh, renouncing or giving up. Uh, and uh, when we talk about renouncing, the Pali word Nekama, it refers largely to the idea of uh, renouncing the world of the five senses. Yeah, And by renouncing... We don't mean that you become a monk or a nun straight away. It's not really what it means. Uh, what it means is that you understand the downside of that world. Uh, and then when you practice your meditation, you give up that world, at least temporarily. Uh, that's really what it means in this particular context. Uh, so it makes the practice of meditation possible. And this is why this Nekama Sankapa is actually very uh, useful, or the Nekama Sanya in this particular case is very useful. Uh, and I've already talked about this a little bit, uh, and some of you were not so happy with that. Uh, <laughs> maybe you thought it was going a bit too far, uh, but uh, it is important. Yeah, if you're going to go deeper on the path, you have to kind of uh, let go of the more superficial things, the things that are not so interesting or so profound, or they're actually outrightly dangerous. Uh, you have to give those things up, and then we get access to something deeper. Uh, and uh, some of these perceptions about... Uh, Nekama or giving up, uh, they are talked about in the Potalia Sutta, which I usually talk about on every retreat. Uh, I didn't quite finish the Sutta yesterday. There was one more of these five ways yesterday, but I'm going to just skip the last one because we uh, did look at the most important things. Uh, and so I'm going to go straight to the idea of the Potalia Sutta. So these are like broad based ideas uh, regarding renunciation. Uh, they have broad views of the five sense world, understanding the limitations of the five sense world. Uh, and when you understand the limitations of that world, uh, the mind automatically goes to deeper things. Uh, this is kind of the idea behind these contemplations. Uh, this is not to force the mind. This is not to kind of make the mind uh, renounce or using force or anything like that. Uh, these are just natural contemplations that lead you in the right direction. Uh, this is the idea. Just like the contemplation of death leads you towards peace and leads you towards karma, yeah, without forcing yourself. Uh, in the same way, these things lead you to uh, um, a gradual giving up of things that are kind of not all that interesting at the end of the day. Yeah. So, Potalia Sutta. So, Potalia, he is this man who uh, uh, thought that he had renounced the world. So, he's wandering around, and as he's wandering around, uh, he comes across the Buddha. The Buddha is in the forest. Uh, and when he sees the, the Buddha, he has a conversation with the Buddha. And the Buddha tells him that, well, actually, you think you have renounced, but actually, you probably haven't really renounced. After all, yeah, you're wandering around with a parasol in hand and wearing kind of fancy shoes, and you think you have renounced. Actually, you haven't really renounced. And he gets really upset with the Buddha. He doesn't like to be told that he hasn't renounced properly. Yeah. 
Yeah, this is kind of a common human thing. Yeah, we have a certain pride very often. And if that pride is challenged, uh, we don't really like that. Uh, and this is what happens with Potalia. Uh, and so they have this conversation. And then the Buddha explains to him what real renunciation means. And uh, this is what these seven similes are about. Uh, yeah, the, about the real renunciation. Uh, so how it comes about. Uh, uh, but before I do that, did you have a nice meditation just before? Uh, yeah, they had a good Okay, good. So, Venerable Punsriva, uh, that means you're hired. Okay. <laughs> That's good. <laughs> no, it's not, no, it's nice that we can work a little bit together, actually, because that's the idea of the fourfold assemblies. That's great. Venerable Punsirivara, you know what that means? You don't know what it means? Okay, Pun is like the uh, Punya, yeah, so merit. And Siri is like splendor. It's like, you know, Sri Lanka is, is like the splendor of Lanka Island. Yeah, that's the idea. And Vara means like the best, the most excellent. Uh, so it means the most excellent splendor of merit. Uh, so the name means. <laughs> it's kind of nice, isn't it? Uh, that was, was it your father who gave you that name? Is that given by your parents or Punsiri? Uh, and what about the Vara? Huh? Where did it come from? You added that one. <laughs> okay. Go to end there. Ah. Ah, okay. So, okay. So you added Vara to make it more suitable. Yeah. 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 Okay. <laughs> okay. Okay, good. I'm glad. Okay, anyway, thank you so much for helping out. It was nice for me just to have a little bit of other things I needed to do this morning. That was great. Uh, so, um, okay, so let's um, carry on then with uh, Majin Manikaya 54, the Middle Length Saying 54, Portalia Sutta. Are you sure you're ready for this? Uh, yeah. <laughs> but those of you who have been on my retreats before, you know exactly what this is about. But for those of you who have not been here before, for you it's going to be a shock. To the system, yeah, this is going to be, <laughs> this is going to be, wow, okay, I didn't, anyway, so, uh, but actually it is not really dangerous, it's just a particular way of thinking about things, that's all, uh, and so let's just get started. So, uh, this is the Buddha speaking to Potalia, this is what he says, householder, suppose a dog, weak with hunger, was hanging around a butcher's shop, then a deaf butcher or their apprentice would toss them a skeleton scraped clean of flesh and smeared in blood. What do you think, householder? Gnawing on such a fleshless skeleton, would that dog still get rid of its hunger? No, sir. Why not? Because that skeleton is scraped clean of flesh and smeared in blood. That dog will eventually get weary and frustrated. Mm. <laughs> In the same way, a noble disciple reflects uh, with the simile of a skeleton. The Buddha said that sensual pleasures, uh, or the, sen the sensory realm, if you like, uh, give little gratification and much suffering and distress. Uh, and they are all the more full of drawbacks. Uh, yeah? All the more full of And then they kind of carries on a little bit after that then. So let's have a look at this again, yeah? So you have a dog, weak with hunger, hanging around the butcher shop. So that dog, who is that? That's us, right? We are the dogs. And, <laughs> and we are weak with hunger because we are always craving. Craving, the hunger here is craving. And craving makes you kind of weak, yeah, because you're always kind of running around. You are at the beg and mercy of the craving. You're a slave to that craving. Yeah? And so you kind of have a weakness because of the mind. The mind that is full of desire is a weak kind of mind. The mind that is strong is the one that gets rid of desire, that becomes very firm and established in samadhi. That's a strong kind of mind. Yeah? And so the, it's weak, yeah, and it's hanging around the butcher shop. That's like hanging around the shopping mall or something like that, yeah? Looking out for all the sensual pleasures of the world, uh, yeah? Hanging around and seeing what's going to happen. Uh. 
And then the deft butcher or the apprentice, well, this is like Mara. Yeah, Mara, sometimes they will give you a little thing, little thing to kind of keep you happy. Yeah, you kind of throw you something. Yeah. And then you, the dog gets a bone, but that bone is completely scraped clean because a butcher doesn't give away real meat to a dog, right? It only gives it bones. In the same way, you get something from the world that doesn't really satisfy, just like a bone scraped clean of flesh. So, of course, gnawing on such a fleshless skeleton, would that dog still get rid of its hunger? No, it never gets rid, rid of its hunger. In the same way, we don't really get rid of our hunger by having occasionally sensual pleasures that kind of come. Yeah? So you get that sensual pleasures, it kind of, you feel satisfied for a short time, and then the desire re-arises again. And this is kind of very interesting, because there is a certain psychology behind this there is a reason why things are in this way. Huh? But before I get to the reasons why it is like this, uh, let's just flesh out this simile a little bit. Uh, because uh, this dog, yeah, what happens to this dog? It goes to this kind of uh, butcher. Huh? The butcher gives it a scraped piece of bone. Huh? Yeah, and you can imagine the dog is very happy. It smells the blood. Yeah, the, it is smeared with blood. It smells the blood. It gnaws this kind of thing, and it kind of gets a degree of satisfaction yeah, because it kind of tastes the blood and these kind of things. But because it tastes the blood, but there is no real sustenance. There's no sustenance because there is no meat. The craving becomes even stronger. Yeah, so the dog gets even more desperate. And then after it gets even more desperate, the dog runs off to the next butcher shop. The next butcher is just as stingy as the previous one because butchers are, I guess butchers are they? Maybe they're particularly stingy, I'm not sure. But usually they don't want to give away good meat to a dog. Is that the same thing with butchers in, in Malaysia? They don't want to give away good meat to dogs? Oh. There's no dogs in the shopping mall, that what you're saying? Yeah. yeah, okay, okay, all right. So that's, okay, so it doesn't, doesn't apply to Malaysia, that's what you're saying. Okay, fair enough. <laughs> so then the dog goes to the next one, and the same thing happens. Yeah, the same thing yeah. over again. Again, the dog does only the taste of blood and runs on to the next butcher shop. And then this way it runs on and on and on and on. And what happens eventually? Yeah. Eventually, while it is running, in the middle of this pursuit, where it never finds any satisfaction, in the middle of this, one day it just dies. But when it dies, it takes that craving, it takes that desire with it into the next life. And in the next life, it gets reborn as a puppy. Yeah? Why is that? Because once you are born as a dog, you tend to become a dog again and again and again. You are stuck in the dog realm. Yeah, then when you get reborn as a puppy, where does your mummy take you? Your mummy takes you to the butcher shop, yeah? And now little puppy and mother standing out the butcher trying to look cute, yeah? Trying to come, but still only gets that bone. And again, butcher shop to butcher shop, dies again in the middle of the pursuit, reborn as a puppy again. And on it goes, on and on and on like this. So what does that sound like? Does it sound a bit desperate? It sounds quite terrible, doesn't it? It sounds kind of awful, and you never really learn. You never learn your lesson. You never learn that this is the wrong way. Why? Because if you are a dog, you haven't got enough intelligence to understand these things. You can't stand back and contemplate. Dogs don't contemplate. That is where we have the advantage. Yeah, We can contemplate. That's why we are here. And this is kind of the good thing. And so we, when we see that we are basically doing the same thing, our life is kind of also run by these desires that always come back, yeah, again and again and again they return. We have one relationship, the relationship fails, okay, next relationship, that will be the right one, yeah? It's always like that. And the next relationship, okay, that will be the one. If this person, they are just right. No one is just right. That person doesn't exist. It's an illusion of the mind, yeah? And then we die, we go into the next life, and yeah, this life, we're going to find the right kind of person, yeah? And then again, it doesn't really work out. And even if it works out, the craving is still not really satisfied. We run after other things. We go from one house to the next house, from one job to the next job, from one car to the next car, from one status symbol to another status symbol. But satisfaction is never found by pursuing these things. And if there is a satisfaction, it only lasts for a short while and craving re-arises. 
You will know that, yeah, because still the reason you are here is because you're still craving. Now you're craving, this is a good kind of craving coming here, yeah? Now you're on the right track, yeah? Craving for the Buddhist teaching. This is the only craving that leads to the end of cravings. Now finally, you're heading in the right direction. Yeah? So well done. Congratulations. <laughs> so this is uh, life for you, yeah? And life it kind of is very stark. We are this dog always running on, always trying something else, never really finding satisfaction there. And it's kind of scary to see that uh, when you start to realize what's going on. Uh, and it becomes especially clear when you look from life to life. Uh, we're doing the same thing again and again and again, never finding the contentment that we really want to find. Uh, yeah, desire is telling us, uh, if you pursue this desire and you get the result, you will be content. But are you content? No, never really content. Or content for a short time, yeah? And then the desire re re arises again uh, so why is that? What is going on here? And the reason that is the case is because there's something missing inside of us. Yeah, the mind is not really complete. The mind feels unfulfilled. And because the mind feels unfulfilled, the mind is like there's a hole inside of us, an emptiness, something that actually uh, is always kind of missing. And because of that, we try to fill the gap within, the hole within, through external objects. I'm going to try to fill it with this and see what happens. So. <laughs> it's, it's, it's deluding, isn't it? It's a very nice drink, so it kind of feels like this is going to be satisfying. Yeah. But then I have to have another one, you see? This is the problem here. <laughs> That's what it is. It's a bit red, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> anyway, just kind of practicing, testing out the reality of these things. So. And so the, pro the problem is that it is a psychological problem that we have. Yeah? It's a psychological problem where you don't feel fulfilled within. There's an emptiness inside, and then we try to fill that with a drink. Yeah? This is like a small one, right? We try to fill it through all the things in our life. But because it is a psychological problem, uh, external things can never really fill that hole inside. The only way to fill the hole inside is to do something with our mind. Yeah, we have to create a mind that is content, that has happiness, that has understanding, that has the qualities whereby craving is no longer required. That is kind of the critical thing. Because if you feel complete inside, then you don't crave for things outside anymore because you don't need those things outside. And that is, in a sense, what the spiritual path is about. You're looking for the fulfilling, the uh, filling of that hole inside in the right kind of way, which is by building up the spiritual qualities. And when you live according to this idea, and you start to look at life in this way, you start to see that when you follow spiritual practice, when you are kind to somebody, when you are generous, when you live a life in this way, you notice that the happiness that comes from the spiritual pursuits, from the spiritual practice, has a different flavor from the happiness that comes from the sensory world. Yeah, the sensory world, it kind of, it doesn't really... It is always more craving just behind. And in fact, while you are drinking this thing, you're still craving, yeah? It's kind of weird. You're drinking, and you're already thinking about the next sip you're going to have while you're having this one. You know what I mean? If you are eating, yeah, you're having a nice meal, and you have like a plate with food in front of you, you, are, you take one you know, fork or spoonful of food, put it in your mouth, and while you are chewing that one, you're already looking for the next one, isn't that kind of crazy? This is exactly how it is, right? Uh, and so as we are trying to enjoy what we have, you're already craving. So it's craving everything we do in the realm of the five senses is imbued with craving. Uh, and that's why it is never really all that enjoyable. Uh, it is always about more, always about going somewhere else. Uh, but if you do a spiritual act of kindness, uh, if you do something which is about following the Noble Eightfold Path uh, and feel the contentment, feel the happiness that comes from doing something which is spiritual, it has a different flavor to it. There is a contentment that comes with that. 
There is no craving that comes along with the kindness of you know just being kind. There's a kind of purity to that happiness uh, which makes you feel peaceful. And that is the distinction. Uh, and so when you do an act of kindness on the spiritual path, first of all, it feels much more happy. It feels happy in a very different way. The kind of happiness you get from sensory pleasures is kind of very, uh, I don't know, it's very not very interesting. Uh, but the joy that arises from spiritual practice is far more tangible and far more interesting in many ways. Uh, and it doesn't have that craving uh, coming with it. Uh, you actually feel peaceful with that kind of happiness. Uh, Please notice this, uh, because then you start to understand the difference between the different kinds of happiness. Uh, the happiness of the five sense world versus the spiritual happiness. Uh, and that is only the beginning of the spiritual happiness. Yeah, then uh, as you develop uh, the spiritual happiness in the right way, you come to meditation practice, uh, and in that meditation, hopefully, you find some real peace and real contentment. Uh, yeah. And then as you do that, the, the desire, the craving is even more subdued. The more peaceful you are, obviously, the less craving you have, because craving is a movement of the mind. Peace is the opposite of movement of the mind. And as the craving disappears, the joy and the happiness multiply manifold as a consequence. The great meditators of the world, they are very joyful people. Yeah, I kind of one of those great things about Ajahn Ganha. Is that where you're going to ordain the uh, wage ranker? No, okay, not there. Okay, just, just testing. I was... <laughs> okay, tell me later on. Uh, one of the kind of great things about him, can we just hold on a, a minute? Yeah, we're going to come, come back to Q questions in a second anyway, so that's great. Uh, and so, one of the kind of great things about someone like Ajahn Gandhi is this kind of very, very happy person. Uh, and the happiness is so imbued in his character. Yeah, he kind of wakes up in the morning and he spreads out the kindness. And then maybe towards the end of the day, he kind of dips a little bit. And then he says, okay, I'm going to kind of withdraw a little bit now. Yeah, too much. And he withdraws. And I, I don't know what, I think he just goes into meditation, right? And because the meditation is so powerful, he recharges the nuclear reactor. Bing, yeah. yeah. And then it comes out with a kind of broad smile on his face again. It comes back to, back to the world. This is like Ajahn Gandha, the deep-seated happiness that comes from meditation. Those people who really know how to meditate in the right way. And this is the happiness of the spiritual path. And eventually, and this is kind of the thing, eventually you become so peaceful that there is no desire at all. All desire is gone. The mind is completely still now. And the reason why the mind can become completely still is because it is completely content and satisfied. It doesn't want anything anywhere in the world. And of course, when you don't want anything anywhere in the world, there's nothing to drive you anywhere. It feels like you have found the meaning of life because the opposite of meaning is always moving on, going somewhere else, trying to find the truth. The moment you don't want to do anything else, by definition, you have found meaning. You have found the purpose. So just that, just the state of samadhi, gives you a sense of having discovered the meaning of life. This is the promise. Instead of running around, forever feeling the emptiness within, the sense of itch, which never really goes away. Yeah, always running, running, wrong, being the slave to craving, as it says to the sutras. One day you turn in a different direction. You understand, don't go to that blooming butcher shop. There is no happiness in those butcher shops, yeah? Go to the temple across the road. That's where you should be going, yeah? The Buddha is there. Go and pay respect the Buddha and ask for some proper teachings. That is the path to happiness. And then you start. You're on this other track. That is where you find real meaning. So you can see how despairing, if you think about it this way, the sensory world is like a world of despair. That's why it said the idea of despair here before, it's a despair because there's just this eternal running around, uh, being Mara's slave, uh, the slave of restlessness, uh, never really finding peace. Uh, that peace can only be found on the spiritual path. Uh, so this is the idea behind this particular simile. Uh, so please don't be that dog. <laughs> yeah, get away from the dog status. Become a real, become a saint on the Buddhist path instead. That's the way forward. Yeah. Okay, let's do a little bit of meditation together here. Um, 
let's take some questions and comments. Um, this, I think this gentleman here wanted to ask, but he, ah, okay, okay, Brian, this, yeah. Ajahn, yeah. um, Tanha towards the karma yeah. is because it, it, it repeats, it's because it's anatta, isn't it? It's because it's anatta. There's nothing uh, yeah. to hold whatever. It's like not permanent or solid, you mean? It's like kind of, it's, yeah. uh, it doesn't have any essence, doesn't have any kind of core to it. Uh, that's why you keep, so that's why you keep craving, yeah. wanting. Yeah, yeah. I and think, yeah, that's, that's a nice, I think that's a nice way of thinking about it. Uh, that's kind of something which doesn't have any essential kind of aspect to it. And uh, so it has to come back again and again. Yeah. I think that's part of it. Uh, but also it is, um, you know, because it isn't very often about the external world outside of us. Uh, uh, usually when we think about atta, we think about internal things. Uh, so this is kind of more external as well. So it has a double kind of double problem to it. It is not permanent. And also it is also external. So it has a kind of double, double negativity. Uh, uh, uh. Yes, good. Uh, yeah. Um, this gentleman here had a question before uh, Niwen, but now he seems to be occupied with with something else. So. <laughs> I'm not sure whether. See what... <laughs> you still have a question? Uh, would you like to ask? Yeah. 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 Okay. It's, great. Uh, about physiological hunger. Yeah. Is physiological hunger is that craving? Um, uh, it, it is. It is craving. You can say that there is. Um, you know, there's, it is physiological hunger, but it tends to give rise to craving. Yeah. And so there's two kinds of issues going on there. And that is that for, on the one hand, if you, let's say you are fully enlightened, you still need food to survive as an arahant, right? Uh, so you take that food, but that food is not kind of that uh, desire you have as an arahant. Uh, it's not the desire for actual essential pleasure. It's just a kind of desire to keep the body going. It's, that's what you call the physiological aspect of things. Uh, not everyone has that, whether you're enlightened or not. Uh, but usually for most beings, the hunger goes together with desire. Yeah? It goes to, together with sensual desires. The hunger gives rise to desire for all kinds of foods. And if, if you're hungry, you go past the window of a shop. You, know, you look at the food and all sorts of craving arises because of that. Uh, there's like a double thing, two things going on at the same time, I think. Yeah. So, uh, is that what you, is that what you meant? Or? Yeah. I think the simile yeah. is not very precise about yeah. real craving. It's just only mentioning, yeah. right. it's not like the dog is going for what. Yeah. The yeah. dog is going for what it needed. It needs, yeah, exactly. Yeah. So I think, but I think the thing is that any simile has certain limitations, you know. Uh, and I think that we should never take the similes too far. They only go to some extent. Uh, they're never going to be 100% precise. Uh, so we have some degree of interpretation is required in these cases. But uh, you're right. I think you have a, it's a good point, actually. Yeah. So, uh, yes. Um, morning, Ajahn. Um, in this morning sharing, um, what you have highlighted is that, that the mind pick up, renouncing the world, renouncing the world, which yeah. is essentially giving up the five senses. So um, I wish to clarify, right, when you say that renouncing the world, which is like giving up the five senses, it is the, is this one of the ten paramis renunciation? Uh... Yes, uh, that would be, that's it. That's the main meaning of renunciation is the re renouncing of the five sense world. But yeah, uh, it goes further than that. That's kind of the main aspect of it. Uh, yeah, so uh, yes. So nekama, what is, the, what is the word in the 10 paramis for re renunciation? Is it nekama? In the, yeah, okay. I don't even know the 10 paramis because it's common, it's commentarial. I'm not so interested in those things. Uh, okay. But uh, okay, good. So thank you. I would just go to confirm this nekama. So that would be the same thing. It's the opposite of sensuality. In fact, the nekama is uh, yeah, the, the compound comes from ni, which is like often a negative, and then karma, which is a desire. So it's the anti desire in a sense. So it means renouncing that particular world of the five senses. Kam desire here, karma means specifically the five sense world, exactly what it refers to quite specifically. So that's exactly what it means. 
Uh, but it can be taken further as well. Yeah, on the Buddhist path, we actually re renounce everything. We renounce all interest in the five khandhas. Uh, and the five khandhas are the five aspects of personality that goes beyond just sensuality. Yeah. So ultimately, it's a very profound, very profound thing. Yeah. So yes, so that's kind of weird, right? That's, that's a very good point you're having there. So thank you for bringing that up. Because just before, yeah, yesterday, we were looking at the Buddha, or the Buddha-to-be, and he was practicing, and he was still involved in the five-sense world, right? He was wife and children and all these belongings. Uh, if you go to the Dveda Vitaka Sutta, he talks about having desire for the sensory world, yeah, all, all of these kind of things. And there, a thought of desire would arise, and then he will deal with that in a certain way. So the Buddha-to-be, even though he's supposed to practice the ten paramis for four incalculable eons, uh, he still hasn't got there. He's still kind of working on it, uh, that's a bit strange, isn't it? Eh? So what, what has he been doing all that time? Eh? <laughs> it should be, it should, but, so the thing is that the whole thing doesn't hold together very well. This idea of you know, being a bodhisattva and, and carrying on for that long doesn't actually fit with what we see in the suttas. Eh? And so that's kind of problematic. Yeah. yeah. Thank you, Ajahn. Actually, um, my first question is the leading question to the next question. Uh -huh. But in between, Ajahn already said, and professions of parami is commentary and wish you well i don't know but anyway i still wish to ask this second question right we leave it to whatever conditions yeah. if conditions permits well this mind has the interest about 10 parami because it feels that that set the conditions one of the tools to conditions the mind into purifying mm. you know what you will do good and purifications of the mind mm. so it's second question is Wish that whether Ajahn could briefly go through the ten paramis so that we can bring this <laughs> mind. But Ajahn already said yeah. something to us the yeah. other way around. Yeah. So I just leave it as such. Thank you. Yeah. No, I yeah, the thing is that uh, the whole idea of the ten paramis, it uh, comes from the idea of the bodhisattva path. Yeah. The idea that uh, uh, a certain person makes a a um, a vow under a previous Buddha and then practices the ten paramis for a long, long time. And this is a later development in Buddhism. And in the suttas, you don't actually find the bodhisattva path. The Buddha doesn't say we should become bodhisattvas. The Buddha says, here is the path that leads to awakening, practice it. He doesn't say you should all become Buddhas. You get too many Buddhas otherwise. <laughs> it's too crowded. Yeah, you can only have one Buddha at a time. It means it never actually, never, nothing ever happens really. Uh, and so that is kind of a misunderstanding. I don't think there is a path to becoming a Buddha. There is no clear path to that. Uh, if there was, maybe the Buddha would have taught it. He didn't. Uh, so who are the people who taught the Bodhisattva path if it wasn't the Buddha? Who has the authority to teach that path? Uh, yeah, That's kind of what I wonder sometimes. Who are these people who taught? Who is it that knows better than the Buddha? That's what I would like to know. Uh, and so... Uh, <laughs> Yeah, that's kind of the issue. So if it isn't in the suttas, if it wasn't taught by the Buddha, I think we have a serious problem. And so I would say this is kind of one of the reasons why we make this distinction between the earliest texts and later texts. And that's why the distinction is quite important, because it allows us to go back and focus on what the Buddha actually taught. The Buddha is the teacher. The Buddha is like what gives rise to everything. That's why we have the Buddha Nusati, the collection of the Buddha, and all of these kind of things, because that is the starting point of everything. And in the suttas, the way the Dhamma is taught is basically a noble eightfold path. And if you practice noble eightfold path, you will be, that's kind of the main thing. Uh, that doesn't mean that the uh, things you see in the ten paramis uh, are not, can be useful. Like one of them is the patience, I think, is one of those ten paramis. Uh, of course, patience is good to be patient, yeah. Uh, it helps to kind of practice virtue and things. Uh, so these things are still useful, but the main focus should be on the noble eightfold path. Uh. Yes, please. Okay, one last one. Okay. Um, well, no, sorry, I don't know how to phrase it, but um, I've been practicing meditation for some years, mm. and when the mind is good, uh, it can understand all these things you're saying in a good light. You know, yeah. like you keep warning us that it looks like a danger and all that. So the mind went, I mean, I went through a bad period in December uh, where I don't know where it's hormonal or whatever, but, uh, and also many things happened, uh, you know, which uh, threw up uh, uh, anxiety, like a very strong anxiety, yeah. uh, like depression, you know. So in that period, I noticed the mind, I was still noticing the mind, you know, I was been noticing the mind all the time. Uh, the mind just cannot have no wisdom at all, like yeah. sees all this in really negative light. 
I have Kalyana Mintas telling me, reminding me, but I just noticed that because the contrast is so great and because now I'm back. So called, yeah. I am back. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, you yeah. know, and it's so joyful to be here and listening dharma and all that. You know, so the mind become bright again. So yeah. you, when everything you say makes complete sense, you know, even before this already, uh, mm. when the mind recover, it already have. So um, my question is like, when I was in that period, like, what could I have done, or mm. if I go into that again, when really yeah. things challenge you, like you know, family yeah. is ill. You know, I mean, there are things that yeah. are very strong. You know, like you said, we are super tanker. The mind is really a super tanker. Like, so things which really um, you are very attached to and you don't have the wisdom, you know, yeah. like you said, uh, you know, you meditate and get the joy. Actually, in that period, I could still meditate. Yeah. Um, it was joyful, but you can't sit all day, you know, like, so when I got up, yeah. then the feeling comes back. I mean, all the reality sinks in, yeah, yeah, you know, yeah, yeah, attachment yeah. comes back and all that. So how do you... Yeah, do so, I, I, yeah, no, I think this is something everyone goes through, yeah. When you go through a difficult time, then you lose, as you said, you lose your wisdom, everything becomes kind of difficult. Uh, but you don't lose your wisdom completely. That's the point. There's always a little bit left. Uh, and uh, you have to hold on to that li little thing that is left. That's what you have to hold on to. Uh, and sometimes that is just some very simple things like this too will pass, yeah. Kind of the Ajahn Brahm teaching, this too will pass. It's a very simple teaching, yeah, but it's also very true. Huh? And you know that, uh, you know, this is why people sometimes commit suicide, because they forget this too will pass. Uh, they think it will last forever. Huh? And this is this delusion of the self again, the delusion that whatever we have now is kind of, will carry on into the future, but it won't. Uh, so just remember some very simple things like that. Uh, remember, remember that uh, just because you're feeling terrible, don't become a bad person because of that. Yeah, I'm sure you probably didn't become a bad person, right? Uh, yeah? So you remember these things. That's already you have a lot of wisdom there underlying, helping you through. Uh, so you lose the clarity, but you still remember some of the foundational things. Uh, and if you remember those foundational things, then that degree of kindness that you have, that degree of... Uh, uprightness that you have uh, together with the ability to wait because you know this too will pass yeah when those things come together actually it will eventually you will come out of it uh, eventually uh, because the it is the nature of things that for good people the future is always brighter this is one of those beautiful ideas yeah for good people the future is brighter so just remember goodness uh, and then eventually you come out of it again uh. mm. And this is exactly what I was saying yesterday. Were you at the talk yesterday? Yeah. This is kind of the idea about the world. Yeah, the future looks really bad. Uh, but remember, the future is always bright for good people. Uh, it doesn't matter what happens in the world. Uh, yeah, the world is actually quite irrelevant. Uh, and that's kind of a beautiful idea. Because uh, it means that, uh, you know, we can kind of just, uh, okay, war in Ukraine. It's bad, uh, but I can deal with it. Uh, yeah, that's kind of the idea. So Ajahn, in, in that light, uh, would, would it mean that we place a little bit of that faith and that, that kind of confidence that in the brightness of things and all that? Is that part of the right view that you're talking about, that, that faith yeah. inside? So, I, I mean, you, you, it doesn't make sense. The world doesn't make sense. But when we say, okay, I, yeah. I have that, that, that kind of faith. But absolutely, and that part of the right view. Yeah, part of the right view, part of it, you have that faith, the confidence. And sometimes you also know it to some extent for yourself, right? Uh, because you know that when you live well, when you do the right thing, you feel good about yourself. So it's not just confidence and faith, it's also kind of personal experience at the same time. So, yeah. Are people okay with the, is, is it too cold? Are you all right? Is it a bit too cold? No, you're okay? Are you sure? Yeah, why are you, are you, are you okay? Yeah, you, I was con well, worried, worried that you're fine now. Okay, I'm getting worried about you. You're going to look like it. You look like you're ready for the South Pole expedition. <laughs> Mini Scandinavia, yeah. Where, where is the snow? We're just waiting for the snow to come. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And we have someone coughing over here as well. Who was the person coughing? Are you okay? You all right? Are you sure? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. All right. Okay. Okay. Try to kind of avoid the aircon. Go and maybe go in a seat where the aircon doesn't blow straight onto you. Huh? See what happens. Uh, only one unit. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Good. Huh? I love this. I think it's, ah, oh, this is nice. <laughs> anyway, yeah. yeah. <laughs> okay. Mm -hmm.